Good morning. Welcome to River Road Presbyterian Church. We are the Moors and we are very glad to join you in worship today. We continue to miss seeing each of you and are grateful for opportunities like this to stay connected. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning. Would you join with me in the opening sentences of Scripture, which come from Psalm 96? O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless God's name. Tell of God's salvation from day to day. Declare God's glory among the nations. God's marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. The Lord is to be revered above all gods. For all of the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before the Lord. Strength and beauty are in God's sanctuary. Let us pray. O oh God, in a universe that seems so immense, it is so easy to feel insignificant. And yet we know that we are precious in your sight. We are unique individuals loved and blessed in so many ways. We stand in awe of you for you created all things. And we dedicate this time and all our days to your service. Accept this offering the sacrifice of praise and worship, so that in worshiping you, we may fully know who you are and truly know who we are, to your glory and praise. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh,
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Children's Time on the Steps. I have asked Ellie Grace to join me this morning because I need some help with this Children's Time. We're continuing to read in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, and we're going to hear um, a story where the Pharisees, they're like religious leaders, church leaders, try to trick Jesus. So, Ellie Grace, I'm going to ask you a question. Looking around, can you point out stuff that belongs to God? The grass. The grass belongs to God. The bricks. The bricks belong to God. The trees. The trees. What doesn't belong to God? Is that a trick question? Yes. Why? Because everything belongs to God because God made all of us. Very good. So everything belongs to God because God made all of us. And see, that's where the Pharisees get tricky because they were looking at money. So we have some money here, and they're like, see, this money belongs to somebody else, and this money belongs to somebody else. And if you looked at our money, you can hold these, you would think it belongs to somebody else. It's got somebody else's face on it, and it's got somebody else's country on it. So hear the story. Jesus, the Pharisees asked Jesus, they showed Jesus a coin, and it has Caesar's head on it, and they say, Jesus, who does this coin belong to? And Jesus says, whose head is stamped on it? And they said, the emperor's, that was Caesar. And Jesus says to them, then give to the emperors the things that are the emperors. But remember, everything God made is stamped with God's image. So be sure to give God the things that are God's. And the leaders left amazed and a little disappointed because they didn't trick Jesus. Jesus tricked them. So remember that question where we were looking around trying to figure out what belonged to God and we realized everything belongs to God? That's what we need to remember that when we think about money and we like to have it, it doesn't own us or belong to us. We have to use it to buy important stuff and take care of each other. But it's not money that defines us. God does. We belong to God. And this is a time of year where we think about how we can use our gifts and our lives and our money to show that we belong to God. So that's something to think about. How can you use your life your time and your money to show that you belong to God. And you ask your parents that. How are they using their time and their gifts and their money to show people that they belong to God and love God? So let's close with prayer. And I'll say a line and you repeat after me. God of stuff. God of stuff. All good things come from you. All good things come from you. Help us to use these things for your glory. Help us to use these things for your glory. So people will remember who we belong to. So people will remember who we belong to. For places all over the world, God. For places all over the world, God. Help us see your image everywhere. Help us see your image everywhere. Being honest and open. Being honest and open. To the way you're at work. To the way you're at work. And we say together, Amen. Amen. All right, thank you for your time. See you next week. Shelly, thank you for the uh, children's time. I now invite you to watch this video, which will tell us a little bit about how River Road Presbyterian Church is a church that makes a difference. Good afternoon, I'm Floyd Cotton. I'm over here at River Road Presbyterian Church, the church that makes a difference. And I'm sitting here with Donya Ransom, a longtime friend of mine here at the church. In fact, the first person I ever met at the church. And uh, we were just discussing uh, the first Sunday I appeared here at church with my wife Nancy. We had moved here from California. Uh, having lived there 50 years, we were looking for churches to join. And uh, we had heard that uh, River Road was very friendly. We walked in the first Sunday, and after the service, eight people walked up to to say hello to us, uh, among whom was Danya and her husband, Tom. And I commented to Nancy that I, I'd like to go back to that church again. We went back the next Sunday. Uh, once again, five or six people came over, and including uh, Tom and Danya. And Danya said, would you like to join us for lunch? And she said, we're just going to Arby's, but why don't you come along? So we did, and uh, uh, Sally and Pete Sykes were there waiting for us. Well, Pete was clerk of session at the time. We had a great time. Pete, had, Pete was uh, had a thousand jokes. It was uh, a 
And Nancy said, it's the only person I've ever met that had more jokes than you did. And I knew it was Irish humor. Anyway, as we were driving away, I said to Nancy, I said, well, I know what church I'm going to go to. And her comment was, well, so do I. And so the following week, we called uh, Bob Ratchin and we got a new member. <laughs> and that's how it was. I don't know if you, I've told you that story before, sure. So, anyway, Donnie is here to, this afternoon because she's made some comments to me as we were sitting uh, about how she has seen the staff pivot in this COVID-19 and help us so much as members of the church. Would you mind mentioning that to I'll be glad to, Floyd. Um, first, I must say that if Tom and I had any small part in your favorable impression of River Road Presbyterian Church, I feel very gratified. Oh, so it was the, you. wonderful to have you here. But I do feel that, that our church leaders, the staff and the session and the diaconate and others have done remarkable things in charting out new trails where there were no signposts to follow. And most likely, seminaries don't usually offer a class in church leadership during a pandemic. But in spite of everything that's happened in the last seven months, our leaders have managed to support and minister to the members of our congregation when there have been deaths and illnesses and so forth. The, um, we have been able to continue to provide education and spiritual growth to adults as well as the children and even launched a new children's learning center, which is, has been successful. Also, our mission efforts, both in the community and beyond, have been successful, and we've carried those out. The staff, with the help of the um, task force, has encouraged membership to communicate with each other, to reach out and, and to, to be in contact and to help when needed, needed and, and a lot of meals have been delivered to sick people, people with surgery or other people, and it's just been remarkable to see other aspects of the congregants' efforts to keep things going are the continuing or is the continuing support of financial help to the church. And in some cases, I understand that members have given more than what they pledged just to offset the, uh, the lack of funds coming in from those people whose incomes have been hurt by the pandemic. All this is, is, we still don't know where it's all going, and it's not over yet, but with our patience, with prayer, with the guidance of God's Spirit, and hard work, we will get through it. We are getting through it. And I am confident that, that we will come through this stronger when the pandemic is over. I think I, I, think I remember that this is about the time of the year we are in stewardship season, or maybe beginning it, I'm not sure what the dates are, but I just wanted to mention one thing that I heard in a stewardship message some 40 years ago back in, when we lived in Pennsylvania. The pastor was closing his message with why we give to the church. And he ended with this sentence saying, give according to your ability to love. And that has stayed with me. What a great analysis or, or perspective on, on stewardship. Danya, thank you so much. You're I, welcome. I, I really appreciate that. Glad to be here. Very good. And I hope each of our members is blessed by God and their friends as well. We ask that God bless America. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet. So open our hearts and minds through the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is Psalm 1. Listen for the word of the Lord. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, 
or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. The old saying goes that you cannot judge a book by its cover. But many an English teacher can tell you that you can judge a book, or at least a student's essay, by its opening paragraph, if not its opening line. Fortunately for us, the Bible is full of classic openers. Think about Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Epic. Or think about Lamentations. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. Tragic. Or think about 1 Samuel. There was a certain man of Ramathame, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoam, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Okay, so maybe they aren't all winners. Fortunately for us, here with Psalm 1, we get another classic opener. Now, Psalm 1 was probably not the first psalm to be written, but it was strategically placed at the beginning of the collection of poetry that we call the Psalms. And it was put there for a purpose. Its job is to convey a simple but powerful life or death message. And the message is this. There are two paths that you can take in life. The path of wickedness or the path of righteousness. One path leads to ruin and doom. The other to prosperity and happiness. Or to use the beautiful imagery of the psalm itself, you can either be chaff, which is the useless part of grain that gets tossed up in the air and blown apart by the wind. Or you can be a tree, sturdy, grounded, fruitful. You want to be chaff? Then put down the book and walk away. Go live your life however you feel like living it. But you want to be a tree? And keep reading. That's a pretty good opener. It's got a strong, clear, central thesis. It's got beautiful imagery that captures the imagination. Nevertheless, I'm wondering if some of us are a little bit skeptical about that central argument. Maybe we're skeptical about the idea that there are only two paths that you can take in life. Maybe that sounds a little bit reductionistic, a little simplified. Life is surely more complicated than that, right? Or maybe we're just skeptical about any promises anyone makes about prosperity and happiness. After all, there are a lot of people out there right now trying to tell us that if we just believe what they say or buy what they're selling, we too will be happy, successful, prosperous. Tech companies, self-help gurus, politicians, and preachers. Or maybe, just maybe, some of us are uncomfortable admitting that although we try to be faithful, some days we feel a lot more like the chaff than the tree. Although we try to do what we can to be sturdy, to be grounded, to be reliable and fruitful, some days we feel like we're being blown about, tossed about, and scattered by forces that we cannot control. Sometimes we just feel disconnected, detached, uprooted. Now, according to this psalm, wicked people feel uprooted because of the choices they have made. You see, elsewhere in the Old Testament, we learn that wicked people place their loyalty in themselves rather than in God. And so as they live their lives, they chase after every impulse, every desire that pops in their head, rather than focusing on living out the way of life offered to us in Scripture. Now, many of us, on the other hand, don't feel uprooted because of any specific choice we have made. We feel uprooted because of the situation that we're in. We are uprooted not because we've made wicked choices, 
not all of us at least, but rather because we have been yanked out of our familiar soil. We have been deprived of our routines, our structures, the things that allowed us to be re-energized and refocused when we were tired, exhausted, lost, or confused. Now the good news is that this experience of being yanked out of our familiar soil, this experience of being uprooted and transplanted, is something that the psalmist could relate to on a deep, personal level. Scholars think this psalm was probably written sometime after the exile, that devastating period in Israel's history when the people were scattered and transplanted into faraway lands. While they were in exile, the people were deprived of some of their cherished rituals and sacred spaces. Nevertheless, they learned how to adapt. They learned how to keep their faith alive and to cling on to their identity as God's people. They did so by bringing their sacred scriptures with them and studying them day and night. They did so by singing their cherished songs and by even writing new ones to address the situation in which they found themselves. And they did so by passing along all of the things they cherished to new generations. Even though they were yanked out of their familiar soil, they were nevertheless able to connect their roots to the life-giving waters of their traditions, of their sacred texts. And in so doing, they were able to keep their faith and hope alive. When I was seven years old, my family moved to Texas. And although I learned to love the Lone Star State, and still do, my parents never really warmed up to the place. I often heard them grumble something like, it's just so flat, and there are no trees anywhere. Now they exaggerated, of course, but for two people who grew up surrounded by the beautiful tall trees and rolling green hills of North Georgia, Texas seemed like a desolate wasteland. And as you can imagine, they were delighted when we finally moved back to Georgia and they found a house with big, tall, beautiful trees in the backyard. At least until one of those trees fell over in a storm and crushed my father's car. Careful what you wish for. Now, like my parents, Scripture is fond of trees. Because like my parents, they view trees as a sign of hope and a sign of life. Scripture is particularly fond of using trees as a symbol for faithful living. After all, trees are sturdy, strong, and reliable. They're also useful. They offer shade, produce fruit, and can be used to create tools and shelter. But perhaps more importantly, the sight of a fruitful, thriving tree was a sure sign that there was a ready source of water somewhere nearby. And therefore, the sight of a thriving tree was taken to be a sign of the divine presence, of a life-giving connection to God. It's not easy to be a tree in Texas. And I'm told it's also not easy to be a tree in the Middle East. It's a hot, arid, dry climate, a place where the sun scorches down upon you all day long. And it's also a place where water is not always easy to come by. Any tree that was going to have a chance of making it had to have ready access to a reliable source of water. And this is apparently especially the case for fruit-producing trees. When the season rolled around for such trees to produce their fruit, they needed more water than normal, and not just to produce the fruit, but also to create the leaves, the leaves that would protect the fruit and give it a chance to grow by offering it shade and protection from the scorching heat of the sun. Now, according to this psalm, we operate in much the same manner. If we want to be reliable, sturdy, grounded, we have to be connected to that which nourishes and sustains us. That is especially the case if we want to be fruitful people, people who can nourish and support other people. As the cliché saying goes, you cannot quench someone else's thirst with an empty cup. Now, for the psalmist, that means that we must maintain an intimate connection with the living God. And the way that we do that is by drinking daily from the stream of life that is offered to us in Scripture, in Torah, not just in the laws of the Bible, but in all the stories, in the grand narrative of God's love for creation, God's love for me and for you. My friends, even when we are feeling uprooted, even when we have been yanked out of our familiar soil, that is a stream of life and hope from which we can always nourish ourselves. And it's not a stream that we don't just drink from every once in a while when we're feeling parched or thirsty. 
No, this is a psalm that wants intimacy and commitment. It wants us to dig our roots down deep so that we drink from that stream day and night. As Ray mentioned last week, it's stewardship season here at River Road Presbyterian Church. And in a couple of weeks, we will celebrate Pledge Sunday. And on that day, you will be invited to make your financial commitment to the ministry of this church. So over the next couple of weeks, we invite you to prayerfully discern where and how it is God is calling upon you to invest your time, your passion, your energy, your wisdom, and your resources to contribute to the ministry of Jesus Christ as it is lived out in this community. Stewardship season is a time for us to ask ourselves where we are planting our roots. But it's also a time for us to ask ourselves what message our commitments is sending out to the rest of the world. When we dig down deep and plant our roots alongside the life-giving streams that God offers us through scripture, through community, through worship, we not only nourish ourselves, but we also send out a much needed word of hope to the rest of the world. This church is working hard to live into its calling, to be a beacon of hope and a place of comfort for a world of confusion, uncertainty, and conflict. We are continuing to support our mission partners, both in our community and throughout the world. And we stand ready to respond when new needs emerge as we continue to navigate this difficult time together. We are also offering opportunities for fellowship, for Bible study, and for worship, both online and in person. We invite you to plant your roots alongside us. Help us to be the church that makes a difference. Help us to share the good news of God's love with the entire world. Amen. Friends, join me now as we join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. God, you are our refuge our strong tower. When the world gets to be too much for us, we turn to you for consolation and healing. Help us today to hear your words of compassion and comfort. Enable us to be those who would willingly serve all people in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We are so easily pulled this way and that way by those who would promise instant healing for all the world's woes. We want to have everything be whole and happy, and yet we do not know what to do. So we pay attention often to the voices that cry the loudest, whether these be voices of blame or promise. In our fearfulness, we love to place blame for all our woes on the shoulders of other people. In our anguish, we seek instant answers from sources that are very often unreliable. Lord, help us. Turn us around. Show us your ways. Help us know that you are Lord and you have provided much for us. You have given us abilities and understanding and created us in ways in which we can be those who would bring your peace and justice. You have blessed our lives. Heal and restore our spirits, Lord. Help us truly place our trust in you and to work in ministries that uplift, uplift people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Be assured that the Lord knows your name. From the beginning, Lord has created in each of us unique gifts and abilities to work for peace and justice till the very end. You have especially blessed River Road to be a strong presence in our community. Allow each person to be assured of your grace in their own life, that they might go and serve and love others who, might be, who we might find along our way in all sorts of situations. People like Roger and Tyler, Jack, Caitlin, Sandy, Sarah, Doug, and Rick, Johnson, Caroline, Cooper, and Sally, Ruth, Caroline, Naomi, Harley, Paula and Mark. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we come through these gates with thanksgiving and praise. Many of us have come with burdens seeking your healing. Others have come with joy celebrating goodness and blessings that abound. Regardless, each one is welcome here. 
We know that there is much work to be done in this world. Injustice, greed, isolation, alienation, all exist when we have forgotten to be your people of peace. As we have spoken the names of people who are dear to us, seeking prayers for their needs, let us also remember to be faithfully working for you in all that we do. Help us give to you our complete faithfulness. Teach us to pledge our allegiance to your kingdom here on earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We offer all our prayers in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. And we also have forgiven, as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom of God, forever and ever. Amen. so glad that you joined us today for worship online and we do want to get to know you better uh, we do invite you to make your presence known and we would like to build a relationship with you uh, we do have in-person worship services now and we would love to have you come and join us uh, we had our first service last week and it went remarkably well so uh, we invite you to consider that they're at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings you do need to sign up before you come uh, this coming week, uh, we will have daily prayer with Andrew Whitehead. Also, uh, we are in the midst of stewardship season, and as you might imagine, this year's stewardship season is quite different uh, because we do not all feel safe gathering together in person. And so we're not exactly sure how this is going to go, but we are trusting that uh, you and others uh, will respond faithfully to keep this ministry going so that uh, we can make a difference in the lives of our community and in the lives of other people. I do invite you to keep up with your pledges. We are very grateful for the support that you've shown uh, during this time of pandemic. Uh, we could not do the ministry we're doing without your faithfulness. 
Uh, I do want to remind you that we have Faith Outside this evening at 5 o'clock, uh, and I encourage you to sign up. There's still time right now. Now, may the grace and peace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with those whom you love wherever they may be, this day, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.